Chapter 6 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 I Capture Jeff. The winding up of the last chapter of this history, with its sad incidents, deaths, and burials, was unavoidable. But it shall not occur again. The true historian has got to get in all the particulars. I did think I never felt quite as downhearted as I did the day or two after the skirmish when our boys were killed. It had seemed as though there was no danger of anybody getting hurt as long as they looked out for themselves, but now there was a feeling that anybody was liable to be killed any time, and why not me? Of course, the old veterans of the regiment were the ones who would naturally be expected to take the brunt of the battle. But there was a habit of sending raw recruits into places of danger that struck me as being mighty careless, as well as very bad judgment. Then there were the great preparations being made for an advance movement, or a retreat, or something, and my mind was constantly occupied in trying to find out whether it was to be an advance or a retreat. If it was an advance, I wanted to arrange to be in the rear, and if it was a retreat, it seemed to me as though the proper place for a man who wanted to live to go home was in front. And yet what chance was there for a common private soldier to find out whether it was an advance or a retreat? Finally, I decided that when the regiment did start out, I would manage to be about the middle, so it wouldn't make much difference which way we went. When that idea occurred to me, I pondered over it a good deal and told the chaplain, and he said it was a piece of as brilliant strategy as he had ever heard of, and he was willing to adopt it, only being a staff officer, it was necessary for him and me to ride with the colonel and the colonel almost always rode at the head, though his place was about the middle. He said he would speak to the colonel about it. It made my hair stand to see the preparations that were being made for carnage. Ammunition enough was issued to kill a million men, and the doctors were packing bandages and plasters and physic and splints and probes until it made me sick to look at them. When I thought of actual war, my mind reverted to my mule, the kicking brute that was no good, and I decided to get a horse. I had got so, actually, that I could hear bullets whistle without turning pale, and having cold chills run over me, and it seemed as though a horse was none too good for me. So I went to the colonel and told him that a soldier couldn't make no show on a kicking mule, and I wanted a horse. I told him I supposed, as chaplain's clerk, I should have to ride with him and his staff on the march, and he didn't want to see as nice a looking fellow as I was riding a kicking mule that would kick the ribs of the officer's horses and break the officer's legs. The colonel said he had not thought of that contingency. He had enjoyed seeing me ride the mule because I was so patient when the mule kicked. He said they used that mule in the regiment to teach recruits to ride. A man who could stay on that mule could ride any horse in the regiment and as I had been successful and had displayed splendid mulemanship, I should be promoted to ride a horse. And he told the quartermaster to exchange with me and give me the chestnut sorrel horse that the Confederate was shot off of. I went with the quartermaster to the corral, turned out my mule, and cornered the beautiful horse that had been rode so proudly a few days before by my friend the rebel. It took six of us to catch the horse and bridle and saddle him, and the men about the corral said the horse was no good. He hadn't eaten anything since being captured, and his eyes looked bad, and he wanted to kick and bite everybody. I told them the poor horse was homesick. That was all that ailed him. The horse was a confederate at heart, and he naturally had no particular love for Yankees. I remembered that once or twice when I was riding with the rebels after they captured me, the young fellow on this horse patted him on the neck and called him Jeff, so I knew that was his name. So I led him out of the corral away from the others where there was some grass growing and made up my mind I would mash him. 
after he had eaten grass a little while looking at me out of the corner of his eyes as though he didn't know whether to kick my head on or walk on me as i sat under a tree i got up and patted him on the neck and said well jeff old boy how does the grass fit your stomach you may talk about brute intelligence but that horse was human he stopped eating with his mouth full of grass looked astonished at being addressed by a stranger without an introduction and turned a pair of eyes as beautiful and soft as a woman's upon me and then began to chew slowly as though thinking i rubbed his sleek coat with my bare hands and did not say much desiring to have jeff make the first advances he looked me over and finally put his nose on my sleeve and rubbed me and looked in my face and acted as though he would say well of course this red-headed fellow is no comparison to my dead master but evidently he's no slouch and if i have got to be bossed about by a yankee as he is the only one that has spoken a kind word to me since i was captured and he seems to know my name i guess i will tie to him and the intelligent animal rubbed his nose all over me and licked my hand i rubbed the horse all over petted him took up his feet and looked at them and spoke his name and pretty soon we were the best of friends i mounted him and rode around and it was just like a rocking chair that poor dead confederate had probably rode jeff since he was a kid and jeff was a colt and had broken him well and i was awfully sorry that the original owner was not alive riding his horse home safe and sound to be greeted by his family with loving embraces but he was dead and buried and his horse belonged to me by all the laws of war and yet i had not become a hardened warrior to such an extent that i could forget the hearts that would ache at his home and i made up my mind that this horse would be treated as tenderly as though he was one of my family i rode jeff around for an hour or two found that he was trained to jump fences stand on his hind feet trot pace rack and that he could run like a scared wolf and everything the horse did he would sort of look round at me with one eye as much as to say boss you will find i have got all the modern improvements and you needn't be afraid that i will disgrace you in any society i was fairly in love with my new horse and except for a feeling that i was an interloper with the horse and sorry for the poor boy that had been shot off him i should have been perfectly happy the chaplain had got in the habit of wearing a nice blue broadcloth blouse which i had brought from home which had two rows of brass buttons on it i had paid about twenty dollars of my bounty for the blouse and had found that the private soldiers did not wear such elaborate uniforms in active duty so i kept it in the chaplain's tent i thought if i was killed and my body was sent home the blouse would come in handy the chaplain wore it occasionally and he said any time i wanted to wear any of his clothes just to help myself an order had been issued to move the following day with ten days rations and some of the boys asked for passes to go down town and have a little blowout before we started they wanted me to go along and so i got a pass too we were to go down town in the afternoon and stay till nine o'clock at night when we had to be in camp i saddled up jeff and looked for my blouse but it was gone the chaplain having worn it to visit the chaplain of some other regiment so i took his coat and put it on as he had told me to the coat had the chaplain's soldier straps on but i thought there would be no harm in wearing it so about a dozen of us privates started for town to have a good time and i with chaplain straps on it was customary when soldiers went to town on a pass to partake of intoxicating beverages more or less as that was about the only form of enjoyment and i blush now twenty-two years afterward to write the fact that we all got pretty full it seemed so like home to be able to go into a saloon and drink beer good old northern beer and who knew but to-morrow we would be killed so we ate drank and were merry one of the boys said when the officers got on a tear they would ride right into billiard saloons and sometimes shoot at decanters of red liquor behind the bar and he said a private was just as good as an officer any day and suggested that we mount our horses and paint the town 
we mounted and rode about town racing up and down the streets and finally we came to a billiard saloon and half a dozen of us rode right in took cues out of the rack and tried to play billiards on horseback it was a grand picnic then though it seems foolish now my horse jeff would do anything i asked him and when i rode up to the bar and told him to rear up he put both forefeet on the bar and looked at the bartender as much as to say set up the best you have got the chaplain's soldier straps gave the crowd a sort of confidence that everything was all right and after exhibiting in a saloon for a time there was something said about horse racing and i said my horse could beat anything on four legs so we adjourned to the outskirts of the town for a race followed by half the people in town we had a horse race and jeff beat them all and wherever i went the crowd would cheer the chaplain they said they liked to see a man in that position who could unbend himself and mix up with the boys there never was a chaplain more popular than the wisconsin preacher was it did not occur to me that i was placing the chaplain in an unfavorable position before the public by wearing his coat nothing occurred to me that day except that we were having a high old time finally after dark one of our boys got into a row with a loafer in a saloon and picked the loafer up and tossed him through the window to the sidewalk this was very wrong but it couldn't be helped there was a great noise cries for the provost guard and we knew that the only way to get out of the scrape honorably would be to get out real quick so we mounted and rode to our camp my horse was the fastest and i got home first unsaddled my horse and went to the tent took off the chaplain's coat and hung it up carefully and was at work writing a letter and thinking how my horse acted as though he had been on sprees before he enjoyed it so when i heard a noise outside and it was evident that the provost guard had followed us to camp and were making complaint to the colonel about our conduct downtown finally the guard went away and shortly the colonel and the adjutant called at our tent and inquired for the chaplain i told them the chaplain had been away most of the day and had not returned the colonel and the adjutant winked at each other and asked me if he wasn't away a good deal i told them that he was away some they asked me if i never noticed that his breath had a peculiar smell i told them that it was occasionally a little loud they went away thoughtfully. Now that I think of it, I ought to have explained that the peculiarity of the chaplain's breath was caused from eating pickled onions of the sanitary stores, but it did not occur to me at the time. After a while the chaplain came back, asked me if anybody had died during the day, took a drink of blackberry brandy for what ailed him, and we retired. The next morning there was a circus, the little town boasted a daily paper and it contained the following the community is prepared to overlook an occasional scene of hilarity among the federal soldiers stationed in this vicinity but when a gang of roisterers is led by a chaplain as was the case yesterday all right-minded people will be indignant it is said by our informant that the chaplain of a certain cavalry regiment was the liveliest one of the crowd that he rode into a billiard-room, caused his horse to place its four feet on the bar, and that he played a better game of billiards on horseback than many worldly men can play on foot. It is the duty of the commanding officer to discipline his chaplain. The chaplain also beat the boys several horse-races while in town, and they say he is a perfect horseman, and has one of the finest horses ever seen here, which he probably stole i had a boy bring me a paper every morning and i read the article before the chaplain awoke and destroyed the paper early the next morning the colonel sent for the chaplain placed him under arrest and the good man came back to the tent feeling pretty bad i asked him what was wrong and he said he was under arrest for conduct unbecoming an officer and a gentleman he said charges were preferred against him for drunkenness and disorderly conduct horse racing playing billiards on horseback riding his horse into a saloon and trying to jump him over the bar and lots of things too numerous to mention 
i felt sorry for him and told him i had been fearful all along that he would get into trouble by going away from me so much and associating with the chaplains of the other regiments but i had never supposed it would come to this wine is a mocker said i becoming warmed up and none of us can afford to tamper with it with me it does not make so much difference as i have no reputation but that which is already lost but you my dear sir think of your position go to the colonel and confess all and ask him to forgive you and i wiped my eyes on my coat sleeve but i was not drunk said the chaplain indignantly i was not in a saloon and never saw a game of billiards in my life i was over to the new jersey regiment talking with their chaplain about getting up a revival among the soldiers and the good man groaned as he said it is a case of mistaken identity bully elder said i if you can make the court-martial believe you you will be all right and you will not be cashiered but it looks dark very dark for you may heaven help you the chaplain was worried all the morning and the officers and men joked him unmercifully at noon the chaplain was released from arrest as we were to move at four p m and he begged so to be allowed to accompany the regiment the colonel told him he could be tried when we got back and he was happy there was a great commotion as the regiment broke up its camp and got ready to move there was the usual crowd of negresses who had been doing washing for the soldiers to be paid on pay-day and we were going away no one knew where and no one knew when we would meet pay-day there were saloon-keepers with bills against officers and standing off creditors was just about as hard in the army as at home i couldn't see much difference but finally everything was ready the ammunition wagons wagon train of stores and a battery of little guns about three pounders had been added i didn't like the battery it seemed to me hard enough to kill our fellow citizens with revolver balls without shooting them with cannon at four p m the bugle sounded forward and with a clanking of sabres rattling of hoofs and wagons we marched outside the picket line past the cemetery where my deceased friends were buried and were going towards the enemy the chaplain and myself were riding behind the colonel when the colonel asked the good man to ride up to a log that was beside the road and make his horse put his forefeet upon it as he did on the bar at the saloon i felt sorry for the chaplain and i rode up to the log and had jeff put his feet up on it i then rode back and saluted the colonel and told him it was i who had done the wicked things the chaplain was accused of and i told him how the chaplain was using my coat so i put on his with the shoulder straps on and all about it he laughed at first and then said then you are under arrest you may dismount and walk and lead your horse until further orders i dismounted like a little man and for five miles i walked keeping up with the regiment finally the colonel sung out gallop march and i got on my horse i reasoned that the order to gallop was further orders and as he knew i couldn't very well gallop on foot he must have meant for me to get on we galloped for about ten miles and were ordered to halt when i dismounted and led my horse up to the colonel and saluted him well you must have had a hard time keeping up with us on foot said he i told him it rested me to go on foot we were just going into camp for the night and the colonel said well as you are rested so much from your walk you may go out with the foraging party and get some feed for your horse and the chaplains i was willing to do anything for a quiet life so i fell in with a party of about forty under a lieutenant and we rode off into the country to steal forage from a plantation keeping a sharp lookout for confederates who might object i guess we rode away from camp two or three miles when we came to a magnificent plantation house and outhouses negro quarters etc the house was on a hill in a grove of live oaks and had immense white pillars or columns in front as we rode up to the plantation the boys scattered all over the premises this was the first foraging expedition i had ever been with and i thought all we went for was to get forage for our horses 
so i went to a shock of corn fodder and took all that i could strap on my saddle and was ready to go when i passed a smoke-house and found some of the boys taking smoked hams and sides of bacon i asked one of the boys if they had permission to take hams and things and he laughed and said everything goes and he handed me a ham which i hung on to my saddle then the lieutenant told me to go up in front of the house and stand guard and prevent any soldier from entering the house i rode up to the house where there was an old lady and a young married woman with a little girl by her side they were evidently much annoyed and frightened though too proud to show it and i told them they need have no fear as the men were only after a little forage for their horses the old lady looked at the ham on my saddle and asked me if the horses eat meat and i said no but sometimes the men eat horses i thought that was funny the young woman was beautiful and the child was perfectly enchanting they were on the opposite side of the railing from me and my horse kept working up towards them rubbing his nose on the pickets and finally his nose touched the clasped hands of the mother and child the little girl laughed and patted the horse on the nose while the mother drew back it was almost dark and the horse was almost covered with corn fodder but the little girl screamed and said mamma that is jeff papa's horse the mamma looked at me with a wild hunted look and then at the horse rushed down the steps and threw her arms around the neck of the horse and sobbed in a despairing manner oh where is my husband where is he is he dead my son my son cried the old lady bring me my papa you bad man said the little child and i was surrounded by the three gentle reader i have been through many scenes in my life and have been many times where it was not the toss of a copper whether death or life was my portion and i had some nerve to help me through but i never was in a place that tried me like that one i had been captured by the father of this little child the husband of this beautiful proud woman the son of this charming old lady i had seen him brought in dead had seen him buried and had thrown a bunch of roses in his grave now i was surrounded by these mourners mourners when they should know the worst cold chills run all over me and cold perspiration was on my brow is he dead they all shouted together i hate a liar on general principles and yet there are times when a lie is so much easier to tell than truth i did not want to be a murderer and i knew by the dreadful light in the eyes of that lovely wife as she looked up at me from the neck of the horse her face as white as snow that if i told the truth she would fall dead right where she was if i told the truth that blessed old lady's heart would be broken and that little child's face would not have any more smiles during the war for mamma and grandma and with a hoarse voice and choking and trying to swallow something that seemed as big as a baseball in my throat i deliberately lied to them i told them the young man who rode this horse had been captured after a gallant fight unharmed and sent north that he was so brave that our boys fell in love with him and there was nothing too good for him in our army and that he would be well taken care of and exchanged soon i had no doubt and bade them not to worry but to look at the discomforts and annoyances of war as leniently as possible and all would be well soon thank heaven take all we have got in welcome said the old lady as a heavenly smile came over her face my boy is safe oh thank you sir said the little mother as a lovely smile chased a dimple all around her mouth and corralled it in her left cheek while a pair of navy blue eyes looked up at me as though she would hug me if i was not a yankee eyes that i have seen a thousand times since in dreams often with tears in them you are a darling good man said the little girl dancing on the gravel path the mother blushed and said why maudie don't be so rude and there was a shout fall in the lieutenant rode up to me and asked as he noticed the glad smiles on the faces of the ladies if this was a family reunion and apologizing for being compelled to raid the plantation we rode away i was afraid they would mention the news i had brought them and the lieutenant would tell the truth 
so I was glad to move on. I was glad to go, for if I had remained longer I would have cried like a baby and given them back the horse and walked to camp. As we moved away I took out my knife and cut the string that held the smoked ham on my saddle and had the satisfaction of hearing it drop on the path before the house. I could not give back the husband of the blue-eyed woman, the son of the saintly southern mother, the father of the sweet child, but I could leave that ham. As we rode back to camp that beautiful moonlight night, I did not join in the singing of the boys or the jokes. I just thought of that happy home I had left, and how it would be stricken later when the news was brought them, and wondered if that fearful lie I had been telling them was justifiable under the circumstances, and if it would be laid up against me, charged up in the book above. That night I slept on the ground on some corn fodder and dreamed of nothing but blue-eyed mamas and golden-haired maudies and white-haired angel grandmothers. End of chapter 6 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 7 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Boots and Saddles. When our foraging party got back to camp and I unloaded the corn fodder from my horse, I was about as disgusted with war as a man could be. The faces of those people I had met at the plantation rose up before me and I could imagine how they would look when they heard that the Confederate soldier, who was their all, was dead. I hoped that they would never hear of it. While I was thinking the matter over and grooming my horse, the chaplain came along and took nearly all the fodder I had brought in and fed it to his horse, and asked me where the chickens and hams and sweet potatoes were. I told him I didn't get any. Then he spoke very plainly to me, plainer than he had ever spoken before, and told me that fodder for horses was not all that soldiers got when they went out foraging. He said I wanted to snatch anything that was lying around loose that could be eaten. I asked him if the government did not furnish rations enough for him to live comfortably, in addition to the sanitary stores. He said sometimes he yearned for chicken. Then I told him his salary was sufficient to buy such luxuries. He was hot and talked back to me, and told me he didn't purpose to be lectured by no red-headed private as to his duties or his conduct, and he wanted me to understand that I was expected to forage for him as well as myself, and not to let another soldier come into camp with a better assortment of the luxuries afforded by the country than I did. He said that he picked me out as a man that would fill the bill and do his duty. I told him if he had selected me from all the men in the regiment as being the most expert sneak thief, he had made a mistake, and I would be teetotally damned if I would go through the country stealing hens and chickens for any chaplain that ever lived, and he could put that in his pipe and smoke it. It was pretty sassy talk for a private soldier to indulge in towards a chaplain, but I was so disgusted to hear a man who should discountenance anything unsoldierly talk so flippantly about taking from the women and children of the country what little they had to live on, because we had the power, their menfolk being away in the army, that I got on my ear, as it were. I told him that I was not much mashed on war, and hoped I would never have to fire a gun at a human being, but now that I was into the business I would fight if I had to, or do any duty of a soldier, but I would be cussed if I would rob hen roosts, and he didn't weigh enough to compel me to. Then he said I could go back to my company, as he didn't want a man around him that hadn't sand enough to do his duty. I asked him if I hadn't better wait till after supper, it being after dark, but he said I could go right away, and he would have another man detailed to take my place. I was discharged because I struck against stealing hens. I saddled my horse, took my share of the fodder, and started for my company to return to duty as a soldier. 
On the way to my company I saw half a dozen soldiers, covered with mud and their horses covered with foam, right up to the colonel's tent, and I stopped to see what was the matter. The sergeant gave the colonel a dispatch, which he tore open, read it, looked excited, and then he turned to me and said, Ride to every commanding officer of a company and say with my compliments that boots and saddles will be sounded in ten minutes, and every man must be in line, mounted, within five minutes after the call is sounded. Then come back here. Well, I was about as excited as the colonel, and I rode to every captain's tent and gave the command. Some of the captains, who were just sitting down to supper, asked, What are you giving us? thinking it was some foolishness on my part. One captain said if I came around with any more such orders he would run a saber through me and turn it around a few times. Another said to his lieutenant, That is the chaplain's idiot that the boys play jokes on. Some corporal has probably told him to carry that message. I got all around the companies, and I went back to the colonel and told him that I had delivered his invitation but most of the captains sent regrets in one way and another, and one was going to jab me with a saber. He called the bugler and told him to blow boots and saddles, and in five minutes to sound to horse. Then he turned to me and said, You will be my orderly tonight, and you will have the liveliest ride you ever experienced. Buckle up your saddle girth and lead my horse out here. I told the colonel I should have to buckle up my own belt a few holes, as I hadn't had any supper, when he told his servant to bring me out what was left of his supper, which he did, one small hardtack. I ate pretty hearty, and let my horse fill himself all he could on corn stalks, and in a short time the bugle calls were echoing through the woods. Men were saddling up and mounting, and picking up camp utensils in the dark, and swearing some at being ordered out in that unceremonious manner when they had got all ready to have a night's rest. There was not near as much swearing as I had supposed there would be, but there was enough. The chaplain came rushing up to where I was with his coat off and asked me what was the matter, and the colonel, having gone to the major's tent, I answered him that we were going to have the liveliest ride he ever experienced, and not to forget it and that probably before morning we would have the biggest fight of the season. "'Come and help me catch my horse,' said the chaplain. "'I turned him loose so he could roll over, and he has stampeded.' "'Go catch your own horse,' said I, with lofty dignity, "'and steal your own chickens. "'I am serving on the staff of the commanding officer, sir. "'I am the colonel's orderly.' "'I thought that would break the chaplain all up, but it didn't. "'The devil, you say?' remarked the chaplain, as he went off in the darkness, whistling for his horse. Gentle reader, did you ever ride on horseback fifty miles in one night on an empty stomach, after having ridden thirty miles during the day? If you never have accomplished such a feat, you don't know anything about suffering. Oh, to this day I can feel my stomach freeze itself to my backbone. We started soon after orders were given on a gallop and if we walked our horses a minute during the whole night, I did not know it. We marched by fours, but I had the whole road to myself as I rode behind the colonel. I wanted to know where we were going and what for, and once, when the colonel fell back to where I was, while he was taking a drink out of a canteen, I said, This is a little sudden, ain't it? My idea was to draw him out and get him to tell me all about the destination of the expedition and its object. The colonel got through drinking, and as he knocked the cork into the canteen, he said, Yes, this is a little spry. That was all he said, and evidently he wanted me to draw my own inference, which I did. Pretty soon the orderly sergeant of the company that was on the advance, directly behind the colonel, rode up to me and asked me if I had any idea where we were going. He said he had seen me talking with the colonel, and thought maybe he had told me the program. He added that he thought it was a shame that men couldn't be allowed a little rest. I told him that I had just been talking with the colonel about it, but I had no authority to communicate what he said. 
however i would assure the orderly that we were going to have the liveliest ride he had ever experienced i knew i was safe in saying that and the orderly remarked that he had about come to that conclusion himself and he left me i had never expected to rise on pure merit to that proud position of colonel's orderly and i made up my mind that if that night's ride did not founder me or drive my spine up into the top of my hat or glue the two sides of my empty stomach together so they would never come apart that i would try to conduct myself so that the commanding officers would all cry for me and want me on their staffs i argued to myself as we rode along that the position of colonel's orderly could not be so very unsafe as it did not stand to reason that a colonel would go into any place that was particularly dangerous as long as he could send other officers i knew that colonels in action should ride behind their regiments and wondered if this colonel knew his place or would he be fool enough to go right ahead of his men i was going to speak to him about it if we ever stopped galloping long enough but everything was jarred out of my head a fellow can think of a good many things riding on a gallop at night and i guess i thought of about everything that night there were few interruptions of the march there were about four stops two being caused by horses falling down and being run over by those behind them and two by carbines going off accidentally one man was dismounted and run over by half the horses in the regiment and when he was pulled out from under the horses he asked for a chew of tobacco and saying he was marked for life by horseshoes he kicked his horse in the ribs for falling down climbed on and said the procession might move on he was all cut to pieces by horses hoofs but he was full of fight the next morning another soldier had his big toe shot off by the accidental discharge of a carbine and when the regiment stopped and the colonel asked him if he wanted to stop there and wait for an ambulance to overtake him he said not if there was going to be a fight i don't use a big toe much anyway and if there is a fight ahead i want to be there if i haven't got a toe left on my feet the colonel smiled and said all right boy i never saw fellows who were so anxious to fight and i wondered how much money it would take to induce me to go into a fight when i was crippled up enough to be excused along toward morning everybody felt that we were so far into the enemy's lines that there must be some object in the long ride and the probabilities of a fight seemed to be settled in every man's mind up hill and down we galloped until it seemed to me i should fall off my horse and die about half an hour before daylight the command was halted and the officers of each company were sent for and they surrounded the colonel separated from the men and he said there is a town ahead about four miles garrisoned by confederate troops we are to charge it at daylight drive the enemy out the other side of town kill as many as possible and when they go out they will be attacked by another union regiment that has been sent around to the rear there is a railroad there and a bridge across a river confederate stores of ammunition provisions cotton etc the stores are to be burned the railroad bridge destroyed the track torn up engines if there are any to be ditched and everything destroyed except private residences you understand the officers said they did and they went back to their companies and ordered the men to get a bite to eat when the officers had gone i was pretty scared and i said colonel suppose the rebels do not get out of that town the colonel was chewing a hard tack when he answered daylight was just streaking up from the east and he held a piece of the hard tack up to the light to pick a worm out of it after which he answered if they don't get out we will those of us who are not killed i always like to eat hard tack in the dark then i can't see the worms to say that i was reassured would be untrue i admired a man who could mingle business with pleasure as he did when talking of possible death and worms in hardtack but death was never an interesting subject to me i wanted to talk with the colonel more and asked him if colonels often get killed and if an orderly was exactly safe in his immediate vicinity 
but he leaned against a tree and went to sleep, and I stood near, as wide awake as any man ever was. I wondered whose idea it was to send us fifty miles into the Confederacy to destroy provisions and railroads. Did they suppose the Confederates didn't want anything to eat? I thought it was a mean man or a government that would burn up good wholesome provisions because they couldn't eat them themselves. And who owned this railroad that was going to be torn up? Why burn a bridge that probably cost several hundred thousand dollars? As I was thinking these things over and finding fault with the persons responsible for such foolishness, the chaplain, who had not showed up during the night, came up to where I was without any hat, leading his horse, which was lame. The first thing he asked me, how I would trade horses. They all wanted my gen, but he was not in the market. The chaplain said he had caught up with the regiment about midnight, and had rode at the rear with the horse doctor. He said this expedition was foolish, and had no object except to try the endurance of the horses and men. I told him that we were going to have a fight in less than an hour, and burn a town, and probably we would all be killed. The chaplain turned pale and looked faint. I had read about hell, and seen pictures of it, from the imagination of some eminent artist but the hell I had read of and seen pictured was not a marker to the experience of the next three hours. In a few minutes the colonel woke up, and the regiment mounted and moved on. An advanced guard was put out further than before, with orders to charge the rebel picket almost into town, and then hold up for the rest of us. As we neared the town it was just light enough to see. The advance captured the picket post without a shot being fired, and moved right into town, followed by the regiment, and we actually rode right into the camp of the boys in gray and woke them up by firing. They scattered, coatless and shoeless, firing as they ran, and in five minutes they were all captured, killed, gone out of town, or were in hiding in the buildings. Then began the conflagration. Immense buildings filled with goods or bales of cotton were fired, and soon the black smoke and falling walls made a scene that was enough to set a recruit crazy. A train came in just as the fire was at its greatest, and a squad of men was sent to burn it, and the colonel told me to go and capture the engineer and bring him to the headquarters. I rode up as near to the engine as my horse would go, and told the engineer I wanted him. He turned a cock somewhere, and a jet of steam came out towards me that fairly blinded me and the horse, and I couldn't see the engine any more. My horse turned tail, the engineer threw a lump of coal and hit me on the head, and I went away and told the colonel the engineer wouldn't come, and beside had scalded me with steam and hit me with a lump of coal. The colonel said the engineer could be arrested for such conduct. Pretty soon the train was on fire, and one of our boys clubbed the engineer, got on the engine, and run it on to a side track, and ditched it, and brought the engineer up to headquarters, where I had quite a talk with him about squirting steam and throwing lumps of coal at peaceable persons. Then the railroad bridge was set on fire, and it looked cruel to see the timbers licked up by flames, but when the burning trestle fell into the river below it was a grand and awful sight. I came out of the fight alive, but with a lump on my head as big as a hen's egg, so big I couldn't wear my hat, and a firm determination to whip that engineer who threw the lump of coal when I could catch him alone. We cooked a late breakfast on the embers of the ruins, and after eating I noticed a sign, printing office, in front of a residence just outside the burnt district, and asked permission to go there and print a paper with an account of the fight and the destruction of the town. Permission was granted, and I went to the office and found an old man and two daughters, beautiful girls, but intensely bitter rebels. The old man was near eighty years old, and he said he could whip any dozen Yankees. I told him I would like to use his type and press, but he said if I touched a thing I did it at my peril, as he should consider the type contaminated by the touch of a Yankee. The girls felt the same way, but I talked nice to them, and they didn't kick much when I took a stick 
and began to set type. I worked till dinner time when they asked me to take dinner with them, which I did. During the conversation I convinced them that I was practically a non-combatant and wouldn't hurt anybody for the world. I worked till about the middle of the afternoon when I noticed that the girls, who had been up on the house, looked tickled about something, and presently I heard some firing at the edge of the town, some yelling, more firing, bugle calls among our soldiers, and finally there was an absence of blue coats, and I looked for my horse and found the old man leading him away. I halted the old man, and he stopped and told me that the Confederates had come into town from the east and driven our cavalry out on the other side, and I would be a prisoner in about five minutes, and he laughed, and the girls clapped their hands, and I felt as though my time had come. I had never killed an old man in my life, but I made up my mind to have my horse or kill him in his traces, so I drew my revolver and told him to let go the horse or he was a dead man. It was a question with me whether I could hold my hand still enough to kill him if he didn't let go the horse, and I hoped to heaven he would drop the bridle. He looked so much like my father at home that it seemed like killing a near relative, and when I looked at the two beautiful daughters on the gallery looking at us, pale as death, I almost felt as though it would be better to lose the horse and be captured than to put a bullet through the gray head of that beautiful old man. How I wished that he was a young fellow and had a gun and had it pointed at me. Then I could kill him and feel as though it was self-defense. But the rebels were yelling and firing over the hill, and my regiment was going the other way on important business, and it was a question with me whether I should kill the old man and see his life-blood ebb out there in front of his children, or be captured, and perhaps shot for burning buildings. I decided that it was my duty to murder him and get my horse, so I rested my revolver across my left forearm and took deliberate aim at his left eye a beautiful large expressive gray eye, so much like my father's at home that I almost imagined I was about to kill the father who loved me. I heard a scream on the gallery, and the blonde girl fainted in the arms of her brunette sister. The sister said to me, Please don't kill my father. He was not ten feet from me, and I said, Drop the horse or you die. The old man trembled. The girl said, Pa, give the man his horse. The old man dropped the bridle and walked towards the house. I mounted the horse and rode off toward the direction my regiment had taken, thanking heaven that the girl had spoken just in time, and that I had not been compelled to put a bullet through that noble-looking gray head. The face haunted me all the way as I rode along to catch my regiment, and when I overtook it and rode up to the colonel and asked him what in thunder he wanted to go off and leave me to fight the whole southern confederacy for, he said, Oh, get out. There were no rebels there. That was the Indiana regiment that started out day before yesterday to get on the other side of the town. The fellows were shooting some cattle for food. What makes you look so pale? I was thinking of whether a man ever prospered who killed old people. End of chapter 7 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina Chapter 8 of How Private George W. Peck Put Down the Rebellion by George Wilbur Peck This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Three Days Without Food after overtaking my regiment and enjoying a feeling of safety which I did not feel in the presence of that violent old man who laid savage hands on my horse and the girls, I began to reflect. Of course the old man was not armed, and I was, but how did I know but those Confederate girls had revolvers concealed about their persons and might have killed me? To feel that I was once more safe with my regiment, where there was no danger as long as they did not get into a fight, was bliss indeed, and I rode along in silence, wondering when the cruel war would be over, and what all this riding around the country, burning buildings and tearing up railroad tracks, amounted to, anyway. 
I didn't enlist as a section hand nor a railroad wrecker, and there was nothing in my enlistment papers that said anything about my being compelled to commit arson. The recruit officer who, by his gilded picture of the beauties of a soldier's life, induced me to enlist as a soldier, never mentioned anything that would lead me to believe that one of my duties would be to touch a match to another man's bales of cotton or ditch a locomotive belonging to parties who never did me any harm and who had a right to expect dividends from their railroad stock if i had the money that was represented in the stuff destroyed by our troops that day i could run a daily newspaper for years if it didn't have a subscriber or a patent medicine advertisement and who was benefited by such wanton destruction of property. As we rode along, I told the colonel I thought that it was a confounded shame to do as we had done, and that such use of power, because we had the power, was unworthy of American soldiers. He said it was a soldier's duty to obey orders and not talk back, and if he heard any more moralizing on my part, he would send me back to my company, where I would have to do duty like the rest. I told him I was one of the talking backest fellows he ever saw, and that one of my duties as a newspaper man was to criticize the conduct of the war. Then he said I might report to the captain of my company. It seemed hard to go into the ranks after having had a soft job with the chaplain, and again as colonel's orderly, but I thought if I got my back up and showed the captain that I was no ordinary soldier, but one who was qualified for any position, that maybe he would be afraid to monkey too much with me. I knew the captain would be a candidate for some office when the war was over, and if he knew I was on to him, and that I should very likely publish a paper that could warm him up quite lively, he would see to it that I wasn't compelled to do very hard work. So I rode back to my company and told the captain that the colonel and the chaplain had got through with me, and I had come back to stay, and would be glad to do any light work he might have for me. The captain heaved a sigh as though he was not particularly tickled to have me back, and told me to fall in in the rear of the company. I asked if I couldn't ride at the head of the company. He said, no, there was more room at the rear. I tried to tell him that I was accustomed to riding at the head of the regiment, but he told me to shut up my mouth and get back there, and I got back and fell in at the tail end of the company with the cook and an officer's servant, and the orderly sergeant came back and wanted to know if the company had got to have me around again. Here was promotion with a vengeance. From the proud pinnacle from which I had soared as chaplain's clerk and colonel's orderly, I had dropped with one fell swoop to the rear end of my company, and nobody wanted me, because I had kicked against stealing hens in one instance, and burning buildings and tearing up railroads in the other. We rode all day, and at night laid down in the woods and slept after eating the last of our rations. I slept beside a log, and before going to sleep, and after waking, I swore by the great horn spoons I would not steal anything more while I was in the army, nor do any damage to property. In the morning the soldiers had scarcely a mouthful to eat, and an order was read to each company that for three or four days it would be necessary to live off the country, foraging for what we had to eat. I asked the captain what we would do for something to eat if we didn't find anything in the country to gobble up. He said we would starve. That was an encouraging prospect for a man who had taken a solemn oath not to steal any more. I told the captain I did not intend to steal any more, as I did not think it right. Then he said I had better begin to eat the halter off my horse, because leather would be the only thing I would have to stay my stomach. The first day I did not eat a mouthful, except half of a hardtack, that I had a quarrel with my horse to get. In throwing the saddle on my horse, one solitary hardtack that was in the saddle-bag fell out upon the ground, and the horse picked it up. I did not know the hardtack was in the saddle, and when it fell upon the ground I was as astonished as I would have been had a clap of thunder come from the clear sky. 
and when the horse went for it my stomach rebelled and i grabbed one side of the hard tack while the horse held the other side in his teeth something had to give and as the horse's teeth nor my hands would give the hard tack had to and i saved half of it and placed it in the inside pocket of my vest as choice as though it were a thousand dollar bill i have listened to music in my time that has been pretty bad and which has sent cold chills up my back and caused me pain but i never heard any bad music that seemed to grate on my nerves as did the noise my horse made in chewing the half of my last hardtack and the look of triumph the animal gave me was adding insult to injury several times during the day i took that piece of hardtack from my pocket carefully wiped it on my coat sleeve and took a small bite and the horse would look around at me wickedly as though he would like to divide it with me again people talk about guarding riches carefully and of placing diamonds in a safe place but no riches were ever guarded as securely as was that piece of hardtack and riches never took to themselves wings and knew regretted more than did my last hardtack each bite made it smaller and finally the last bite was taken with a sigh and nothing remained for me to eat but the halter some of the boys went out foraging and were moderately successful while others did not get a thing to eat the country was pine woods with few settlers and those that lived there were so poor that it seemed murder to take what they had one of the men in our company came back with about two quarts of cornmeal that night and i traded him a silver watch for about a pint of it i mixed it up in some water and after the most of the men had fallen asleep i made two pancakes of the wet meal and put them in the ashes of the campfire to bake but fell asleep before it was done and when i woke up and reached into the ashes for the first pancake it was gone some union soldier whom it were base flattery to call a thief had watched me and stole my riches as i slept robbed me of all i held dear in life with trembling hands i raked the ashes for my other pancake hopelessly because i thought that too was gone but to my surprise i found it the villain who had pursued me as i slept had failed to discover the second pancake and i was safe and my life was saved i have seen a play in a theatre in which a miser hides his gold first in one place then in another looking to the right and to the left to see if anybody was watching him i was the same kind of a miser about my pancake if i hid it in the woods i might fail to find the place in the morning where i had hid it and besides some soldier that was peacefully snoring near me apparently might have one eye on me and commit burglary if i put it in my pocket and went to sleep i might have my pocket picked so i concluded to remain awake and hold it in my hands there appeared to be nothing between me and death by starvation except that cornmeal pancake and i sat there for an hour beside the dying embers of the campfire trying to make up my mind who stole my other pancake and what punishment should be meted out to him if i ever found him out i would follow him to my dying day i suspected the captain the colonel the chaplain and six hundred soldiers any one of whom was none too good to steal a man's last pancake if he was hungry to this day i have never found out who stole my pancake but i have not given up the search and if i live to be as old as methuselah and i find out the fellow that put himself outside my pancake that dark night in the pine woods i will gallop all over that old soldier if he is older than i am that is the kind of avenger that is on the track of that pancake eater i sat there and nodded over my remaining pancake clutched in my hands and finally started to my feet in alarm suppose i should fall asleep and be robbed the thought was maddening i have read of indians who would eat enough at one sitting to last them several days and the thought occurred to me that if i ate the pancake my enemies could not get it away from me and perhaps it would digest gradually a little each day and brace me up until we got where there were rations plenty so i sat there and deliberately ate every mouthful of it and looked around at the sleeping companions with triumph lay down and slept as peacefully on the ground as i ever slept in bed 
There may be truth in the story about Indians eating enough to last them a week, but it did not work in my case, for in the morning I was hungry as a she-wolf. The pancake had gone to work and digested itself right at once, as though there was no end of food, and my stomach yearned for something. I walked down by the quartermaster's wagons about daylight, and there was a four-mule team, each with a nose-bag on, with corn in it. The mules were eating corn, unconscious of a robber being near. At home, where I had lived on good fresh meat, bread, pie, everything that was good, nobody could have made me believe that I would steal corn from a government mule. But when I heard the mules eating that corn, a demon possessed me and I meditated robbery. I did not want to take all the corn I wanted from one mule. I went up to the first one and reached my hand down into the nose-bag beside the mule's mouth and rescued a handful of corn, then went to another to do the same. But that mule kicked at the scheme. I went to two others, and they laid their ears back and began to kick at the trace chains. So I went back to my first love, the patient mule, and took every last kernel of corn in the bag, and as I went away with a pocket full of corn, the mule looked at me with tears in its eyes. But I couldn't be moved by no mule tears with hunger gnawing at my vitals, so I hurried away like a guilty thing. While I was parching the corn stolen from the mule in half of a tin canteen over the fire, the chaplain came along and wanted to sample it. He was pretty hungry but I wasn't running a free boarding-house for chaplains any more, and I told him he must go forage for himself. He said he would give his birthright for a pocketful of corn. I told him I didn't want any birthright unless a birthright would stay a man's stomach, but if he would promise to always love, honor, and obey me, I would tell him where he could get some corn. He swore by the great bald-headed Elijah that if I would steer him onto some corn he would remember me the longest day he lived and pray for me. I never was very much mashed on the chaplain's influence at the throne, but I didn't want to see him starve while government mules were living on the fat of the land. So I told him to go down to the quartermaster's corral and rob the mules, as I had done. He bit like a bass and started for the mules. Honestly, I had no designs on the chaplain, but he traded me a kicking mule once and got a good horse of me because I thought he wanted to do me a favor. As he was familiar with mules, I supposed he would know how to steal a little corn. Pretty soon I heard a great commotion down there, and presently the chaplain came out with a mule chasing him, its ears laid back and blood in its eyes. The chaplain was white as a sheet and yelling for help. Before I could knock the mule down with a neck yoke, the animal had grabbed the chaplain by the coat-tail with its mouth, taking some of his pants also, and perhaps a little skin, raised him up into the air about seven feet, let go of him, and tried to turn around and kick the good man on the fly as he came down. We drove the mule away, rescued the chaplain, tied his pants together with a piece of string, cut off the tail of his coat, which the mule had not torn off, so it was the same length as the other one, and made him look quite presentable, though he said he knew he could never ride a horse again. It seems that instead of reaching into the nose-bag and taking a little corn, he had unbuckled the nose-bag and taken it off. I told him he was a hog and ought to have known better than to take the nose-bag off, thus leaving the mule's mouth unmuzzled while the animal was irritated. He accused me of knowing that the mule was vicious and deliberately sending him there to be killed. So rather than having any hard feelings, I gave him a handful of my parched corn. A few Sundays afterwards I heard him preach a sermon on the sin of covetousness, and I thought how beautifully he could have illustrated his sermon if he had turned around and showed his soldier audience where the mule ate his coat-tail. Soon we saddled up and marched another day without food. Reader, were you ever so hungry that you could see, as plain as though it was before you, a dinner-table set with a full meal, roast beef, mashed potatoes, pie, all steaming hot, ready to sit down to? If you have not been very hungry in your life, 
you cannot believe that one can be in a condition to see things. The man with delirium tremens can see snakes, while the hungry man in his delirium can see things he would like to eat. Many times during that day's ride through the deserted pine woods, with my eyes wide open, I could see no trees, no ground, no horses and men around me, but there seemed a film over the eyes, and through it I could see all of the good things I had ever eaten. One moment there would be a steaming roast turkey on a platter ready to be carved. Again I could see a kettle over a cook stove with a pigeon pot pie cooking, the dumplings light as a feather bobbing up and down with the steam, and I could actually smell the odor of the cooking pot pie. It seemed strange and unbelievable to those who have never experienced extreme hunger or thirst that the imagination can picture eatables and streams of running water so plain that one will almost reach for the eatables or rush for the imaginary stream to plunge in and quench thirst. But I have experienced both of those sensations for thirteen dollars a month and nary a pension yet. It is such experiences that bring gray hairs to the temples of young soldiers and cause eyes to become hollow and sunken in the head. Today your Uncle Samuel has not got silver dollars enough in his treasury to hire me to suffer one day of such hunger as to make me see things that were not there, but twenty-two years ago it was easy to have fun over it and to laugh it off the next day. When we stopped that day at noon to rest, the company commissary sergeant came up to the company with two men carrying the hind quarter of an animal that had been slaughtered, and he began to cut it up and issue it out to the men. It was peculiar-looking meat, but it was meat, and every fellow took his ration, and it was not long before the smell of broiled fresh meat could be heard all around. When I took my meat, I asked the sergeant what it was and where he got it. I shall always remember his answer it was this. Young man, when you are starving and the means of sustaining life are given you, take your rations and go away, and don't ask any fool questions. If you don't want it, leave it. Leave it? Egad, I would have eaten it if it had been a Newfoundland dog, and I took it and cooked it and ate it. I do not know and never did what it was, but when the quartermaster's mule teams pulled out after dinner, there were two spike teams, that is, two-wheel mules and a single leader, instead of four mule teams. After I saw the teams move out, each mule looking mournful, as though each one thought his time might come next, I didn't want to ask any questions about that meat, though I know there wasn't a beef critter within fifty miles of us, I have had my children ask me many times if I ever ate any mule in the army, and I have always said that I did not know, and I don't, but I am a great hand to mistrust. It was on this hungry day, when filled with meat such as I had never met before, that I did a thing I shall always regret. The captain came down to the rear of the company and said, so we could all hear it, I want two men to volunteer for a perilous mission. I want two as brave men as ever lived. Who will volunteer? Don't all speak at once. Take plenty of time, for your lives may pay the penalty. I had been feeling for some days as though there was not the utmost confidence in my bravery among the men, and I had been studying as to whether I would desert and become a wanderer on the face of the earth or do some desperate deed that would make me solid with the boys. And when the captain called for volunteers, I swallowed a large lump in my throat and said, Captain, here is your mule. I will go. Whether it was that confounded meat I had eaten that had put a seeming bravery into me, or desperation at the hunger of the past few days, I do not know. But I volunteered for a perilous mission. A little Irishman named McCarty spoke up and said, Captain, I will go anywhere that red-headed recruit will go. So it was settled that McCarty and myself should go, and with some misgivings on my part we rode up to the front and reported. I thought what a fool I was to volunteer when I was liable to be killed. But I was in for it, and there was no use squealing now. 
we came to a cross-road and the captain whispered to us that we should camp there and that he had been told by a reliable contraband that up the cross-road about two miles was a house at which there was a sheep and he wanted us to go and take it he said there might be rebels anywhere and we were liable to be ambushed and killed but we must never come back alive without sheep meat well we started off mccarty said i better ride a little in advance so if we were ambushed i would be killed first and he would rush back and inform the captain i tried to argue with mccarty that i being a recruit and he a veteran it would look better for him to lead but he said i volunteered first and he would waive his rights of precedence and ride behind me so we rode along and i reflected on my changed condition a few short weeks ago i was a respected editor of a country newspaper in wisconsin looked up to to a certain extent by my neighbors and now i had become a sheep thief at home the occupation of stealing sheep was considered pretty low down and no man who followed the business was countenanced by the best society a sheep thief or one who was suspected of having a fondness for mutton not belonging to him was talked about and for thirteen dollars a month and an insignificant bounty i had become a sheep thief if i ever run another newspaper after the war how did i know but a vile contemporary across the street would charge me with being a sheep thief and prove it by mccarty maybe this was a conspiracy on the part of the captain whom i suspected of a desire to run for office when we got home to get me in his power so that if i went for him in my paper he could charge me with stealing sheep it worked me up considerable but we were out of meat and if there was a sheep in the vicinity and i got it there was one thing sure they couldn't get any more mule down me so we rode up to the plantation which was apparently deserted there was a lamb about two-thirds grown in the front yard and mccarty and myself dismounted and proceeded to surround the young sheep as we walked up to it the lamb came up to me bleeding licked my hand and then i noticed there was a little sleigh-bell tied to its neck with a blue ribbon the lamb looked up at us with almost human eyes and i was going to suggest that we let it alone when mccarty grabbed it by the hind legs and was going to strap it to his saddle when it set up a bleeding and a little boy come rushing out of the house a bright little fellow about three years old who could hardly talk plain i wanted to hug him he looked so much like a little black-eyed baby at home that was too awfully small to say good-bye papa when i left the little fellow with the dignity of an emperor said here sir you must not hurt my little pet lamb put him down sir or i will call the servants and have you put off the premises mccarty laughed and said the lamb would be fine eatin for the boys and was pulling the little thing up when the tears came into the boy's eyes and that settled it i said mac for heaven's sake drop that lamb i wouldn't break that little boy's heart for all the sheep meat on earth i will eat mule or a dog but i draw the line at children's household pets let the lamb go begorra you're right said mccarty as he let the lamb down look at how the ship runs to the little by ah me little mon your pet shall not be taken away from yez and a big tear ran down mccarty's face the boy said there was a great big sheep in the back yard we could have if we were hungry and we went around the house to see there was an old black ram that looked as though he could whip a regiment of soldiers but we decided that he was our meat mccarty suggested that i throw him a lariat rope around his horns and lead him whilst he would go behind and drive the animal that looked feasible and taking a horsehair picket rope off my saddle with a slip of noose in the end i tossed it over the horns of the ram tied the rope to the saddle and started the ram went along all right till we got out to the road when he held back a little mac jabbed the ram in the rear with his sabre and he came along all right only a little too sudden that was one of the mistakes of the war mac's pricking that ram and it has been the source of much study on my part for twenty-two years as to whether the irishman did it on purpose 
knowing the ram would charge on my horse and butt my steed in the hind legs if that was the plan of the irishman it worked well for the first thing i knew my horse jumped about eighteen feet and started down the road towards camp on a run dragging the ram which was bellowing for all that was out i tried to hold the horse in a little but every time he slackened up the ram would gather himself and run his head full tilt against the horse and away he would go again sometimes the ram was flying through the air at the end of the rope then it would be dragged in the sand and again it would strike on its feet and all the time the ram was blatting and the confounded irishman was yelling and laughing we went into the camp that way and the whole regiment hearing the noise turned out to see us come in as my horse stopped and the ram was caught by a colored man who tied its legs i realized the ridiculousness of the scene and would have gone off somewhere alone and hated myself or killed the irishman but just then i saw the captain and i said captain i have to report that the perilous expedition was a success there's your sheep and i rode away resolved that that was the last time i should ever volunteer for perilous duty the irishman was telling a crowd of boys the particulars and they were having a great laugh when i said mccarty you are a villain i believe you set that ram on to me on purpose henceforth we are strangers Begob, said the irishman as he held his sides with laughter yes told me to drive the shape and didn't i obey end of chapter eight recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina chapter nine of how private george w peck put down the rebellion by george wilbur peck this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Bacon and Hardtack The next day we arrived at a post where rations were plenty, and where it was announced we should remain for a week or two. So we drew tents and made ourselves as comfortable as possible. It did seem good to again be where we did not have to depend on our own resources of stealing for what we wanted to eat. To be able to draw from the commissary regular rations of meat, tea, coffee, sugar, baker's bread, and beans was joy indeed, after what we had gone through, and we almost made hogs of ourselves. There was one thing, those few days of starvation taught us a lesson, and that was, when ordered on a trip with two days' rations, to take at least enough for six days, especially of coffee and salt pork or bacon with coffee and a piece of old smoked bacon a man can exist a long time i remember after that trip wherever i went there was a chunk of bacon in one of my saddle-bags that nobody knew anything about and many a time on long marches when hunger would have been experienced almost as severe as the time written about last week i would take out my chunk of bacon cut off a piece and spread it on a hardtack and eat a meal that was more strengthening than any meal delmonico ever spread it was at this post that the boys in the regiment played a trick that caused much fun throughout all the army there were a few men in each company who had the chills and fever or ague and the surgeon gave them each morning a dose of whiskey and quinine it was interesting to see a dozen soldiers go to surgeon's call take their bitters and return to their quarters the boys would go to the surgeon's tent sort of languid and drag along and after swallowing a good swig of whiskey and quinine they would walk back to their quarters swinging their arms like pat rooney on the stage and act as though they could whip their weight in wildcats i got acquainted with the hospital steward and he said if the boys were not careful they would all be down with the ague and that an ounce of prevention was worth more than a pound of cure i thought i would take advantage of his advice so i fell in with the sick fellows the next morning and when the doctor asked what's the matter i said chills and he said take a swallow out of the red bottle i took a swallow and it was bitter but it had whiskey in it more than quinine and the idea of beating the government out of a drink of whiskey was pleasure enough to overcome the bitter taste 
I took a big swallow, and before I got back to my quarters I had had a fight with a mule driver, and when the quartermaster interfered I had insulted him by telling him I knew him when he carried a hod before the war, and I shouted, Mort, more and Mort, until he was going to lather me with a mule whip, but he couldn't catch me. As I run by the surgeon's tent, somebody remarked that I had experienced a remarkably sudden cure for chills. The whiskey was not real good, but as I had heard the hospital steward say they had just put in a requisition for two barrels of it to be prepared for an epidemic of chills, I thought the boys ought to know it. So that day I went around to the different companies and told the boys how to play it for a drink. There are very few soldiers in the best regiment that will not take a drink of whiskey when far away from home, discouraged, and worn out by marching, and our fellows looked favorably upon the proposition to all turn out to surgeon's call the next morning. I shall never forget the look on the face of the good old surgeon as the boys formed in line in front of his tent the next morning. The last time I saw him he was in his coffin, about five years ago, at the soldier's home, and a few of the survivors of the regiment that lived here had gone out to the home to take a last look at him, and act as mourners at the funeral. He looked much older than when he used to ask us fellows the conundrum, What's the matter? But there was that same look on his white cold face that there was the morning that nearly the whole regiment reported for bitters. There must have been four hundred men in line, and it happened that I was the first to be called. When he asked me about my condition, and I told him of the chills, he studied a minute, then looked at me, and said, You are bilious. David, give him a dose of castor oil. I know I turned pale, for it was a great come-down from quinine and whiskey to castor oil for a healthy man, and I kicked. I told him I had the shakes awfully and all I wanted was a quinine powder. I knew they had put all their quinine into a barrel of whiskey, so I was safe in asking for dry quinine. The good old gentleman finally relented on the castor oil and told David to give me a swallow of the quinine bitters, but there was a twinkle in his eye as he noticed what a big swallow I took, and then he said, You will be well tomorrow. You needn't come again. I dropped out of the ranks with my skin full of quinine and whiskey, and watched the other fellows. There were men in the line who had never been sick a day since they enlisted, big fellows that would fight all day and stand picket all night, and who never knew what it was to have an ache. And it was amusing to see them appear to shake and to act as though they had chills. Some of them could not keep from laughing and it was evident that the doctor had his doubts about there being so many cases of chills, but he dosed out the quinine and whiskey as long as there was a man who shook. As each man took his dose, he would show two expressions on his face. One was an expression of hilarity at putting himself outside of a good swig of whiskey, and the other was an expression of contempt for the bitter quinine, and an evident wish that the drug might be left out. When all had been served, they lingered around the surgeon's quarters, talking with each other and laughing. Others formed on for a stag quadrille, and danced while a nigger fiddled. Some seemed to feel as though they wanted someone to knock a chip off their shoulders. Old grudges were talked over, and several fights were prevented by the interference of friends, who were jolly and happy, and who did not believe in fighting for fun, when there was so much fighting to be done in the way of business. The old doctor walked up and down in front of his tent in a deep study. He was evidently thinking over the epidemic of ague that had broken out in a healthy regiment, and speculating as to its cause. Suddenly an idea seemed to strike him, and he walked up to a crowd of his patients who were watching a couple of athletes who had just taken their quinine, and who had put on boxing gloves and were pasting each other in the nose. One moment, said the old doctor. The boys stopped boxing, and every last sick man listened respectfully to what the old doctor said. Boys, said he, you have got it on me this time. I don't believe a confounded one of you has got ague at all. You shook me for the whiskey. After this, quinine will be dealt out raw, without any whiskey, 
and now you can shake all you please. Someone proposed three cheers for the boys that had made Uncle Sam stand treat, and the cheers were given, and the boys separated to talk over the event. The next morning only the usual number of sick were in attendance at surgeon's call. The healthy fellows didn't want to take quinine raw. About this time an incident occurred that was fraught with great importance to the country and to me, though the historians of the war have been silent about it in their histories, whether through jealousy or something else I do not know, and modesty has prevented me from making any inquiries as to the cause. The incident alluded to was my appointment as corporal of my company. I say the incident was fraught with importance. I do not know the meaning of the word fraught, but it is frequently used in history in that connection, and I throw it in, believing that it is a pretty good word. The appointment came to me like a stroke of paralysis. I was not conscious that my career as a soldier had been such as to merit promotion. I could not recall my particularly brilliant military achievement that would warrant my government selecting me from the ranks and conferring honors upon me, unless it was my lassoing that ram and dragging him into camp when we were out of meat. But it was not my place to inquire into the cause that had led to my sudden promotion over the rank and file. I thought if I made too many inquiries it would be discovered that I was not such an all-fired great soldier after all. If the government had somehow got the impression that I was well calculated to lead hosts to victory, and it was an erroneous impression, it was the government's place to find it out without any help on my part. I would accept the position with a certain dignity, as though I knew that it was inevitable that I must sooner or later come to the front. So when the captain informed me that he should appoint me corporal, I told him that I thanked him and through him the nation, and would try and perform the duties of the exacting and important position to the best of my ability, and hoped that I might not do anything that would bring discredit upon our distracted country. He said that would be all right, but that he had no doubt the country would pull through. That evening, at dress parade, the appointment was read, and I felt elated. I thought it singular that the regiment did not break out into cheers and make the welkin ring, though they may not have had any welkin to ring. However, I thought it was my duty to make a little speech, acknowledging the honor conferred upon me, as I had read that generals and colonels did when promoted. I took off my hat and said, Fellow soldiers, that was the end of my speech, for the captain turned around and said to the orderly sergeant, Stop that red-headed cuss's mouth some way. And the orderly told me to dry up. Everybody was laughing, I supposed, at the captain. Anyway, I felt hurt, and when we got back to camp, the boys of all the company surrounded me to offer congratulations, and I was called on for a speech. Not being in the ranks, nobody could prevent me from speaking, so I got up on a barrel and said, Fellow soldiers, as I was about to remark, when interrupted by the captain, on dress parade, this office has come to me entirely unsought. It has not been my wish to wear the gilded trappings of office and command men, but rather to fight in the ranks, a private soldier. I enlisted as a private, and my ambition has been to remain in the ranks to the end of the war. But circumstances over which I have no control has taken me and placed me on the high pinnacle of corporal, and I must bow to the decree of fate. Of course, in my new position there must necessarily be a certain gulf between us. I have noticed that there has been a gulf between me and the officers, and I have thought it wrong. I have thought that privates and officers should mingle together freely and share each other's secrets, privations, and rations. But since being promoted, I can readily see that such things cannot be. The private has his position, and the officer has his, and each must be separate. It is not my intention to make any radical changes in the conduct of military affairs at present, allowing things to go along about as they have but as soon as I have a chance to look about me, certain changes will be made. 
all i ask is that you my fellow soldiers shall stand by me follow where i shall lead and at this point in my address the head of the barrel on which i stood fell in with a dull thud and i found myself up to the neck in corned beef brine the boys set up a shout some fellow kicked over the barrel and they began to roll it around the camp with me in it this was a pretty position for a man just promoted to the proud position of corporal as they rolled me about and yelled like indians i could see that an official position in that regiment was to be no sinecure all official positions have more or less care and responsibility but this one seemed to me to have too much finally they spilled me out of the barrel and i was a sight to behold my first idea was to order the whole two hundred fellows under arrest and have them court-martialed for conduct unbecoming soldiers but on second thought i concluded that would seem an arbitrary use of power so i concluded to laugh it off one fellow said they begged pardon for any seeming disrespect to an official but it had always been customary in the regiment to initiate a corporal who was new and too fresh with salt brine i said that was all right and i invited them all up to the chaplain's tent to join me in a glass of wine the chaplain was away and i knew he had received a keg of wine from the sanitary commission that day so we went up to his tent and drank it and everything passed off pleasantly until the chaplain happened in the boys dispersed as soon as he came and left me to fight it out with a good man he was the maddest truly good man i have ever seen i tried to explain about my promotion and that it was customary to set him up for the boys and that there was no saloon near and that he had always told me to help myself to anything i wanted but he wouldn't be calm at all i tried to quote from paul's epistle about taking a little wine for the stomach ache but he just raved around and called me names until i had to tell him that if he kept on i would in my official capacity as corporal place him under arrest that seemed to calm him a little for he laughed and finally he said i smelled of stale corned beef and he kicked me out of his tent and i retired to my quarters to study over the mutability of human affairs and the unpleasant features of holding official position that night i dreamed that general grant and myself were running the army in splendid shape and that we were in receipt of constant congratulations from a grateful country for victories he and i seemed to be great chums i dreamed of engagements with the enemy in which i led men against fearful odds and always came out victorious i woke up before daylight and was wondering what dangerous duty i would be detailed to lead men upon when the orderly poked his head in my tent and told me i was detailed to take ten picked men at daylight for hard service and to report at once i felt that my time had come to achieve renown and i dressed myself with unusual care putting on the blouse with two rows of buttons which i had brought from home i borrowed a pair of corporal's chevrons and sewed them to the sleeve of my blouse and was ready to die if need be i placed a testament i had brought from home inside my blouse in a breast pocket as i had read of many cases where a testament had been struck with a bullet and saved a soldier's life i placed all my keepsakes in a package and told my tent mate that i was going out with ten picked men and it was possible i might never show up again and if i fell he was to send the articles to my family i wondered that i did not feel afraid to die i was no professor of religion though i had always tried to do the square thing all around but with no consolation of religion at all i felt a sweet peace that was indescribable if it was my fate to fall in defence of my country at the head of ten picked men so be it somebody must die and why not me i was no better than thousands of others and while life was sweet to me and i had anticipated much pleasure in life after the war and shooting ducks and holding office i was willing to give up all hope of pleasure in the future and die like a thoroughbred i was glad that i had been promoted and wondered if they would put corporal on my tombstone 
i wondered if i fell that day at the head of my men if the papers at the north and particularly in wisconsin would say the deceased had just been promoted for gallant conduct to the position of corporal and it will be hard to fill his place with these thoughts i sadly reported to the orderly the ten picked men were in line they were four of them irishmen two yankees two germans a welshman and a scotchman the orderly gave me a paper sealed in an envelope i turned to my men and said boys whatever happens to-day i don't want to see any man show the white feather the world will read the accounts of this day's work with feelings of awe and the country will care for those we leave behind we started off and it occurred to me to read my instructions i opened the envelope with the air of a general who was accustomed to receive important messages i read it and almost fainted it read report to the quartermaster at the steamboat landing to unload quartermaster's stores from steamer gazelle ye gods and this was the hard service that i was to lead ten picked men into they had picked out ten stevedores to carry sacks of corn and hardtack boxes and barrels of pork and that was the action i was to engage in as my first duty as corporal i almost cried we rode down to the landing where a dozen teams were waiting to be loaded it was all i could do to break the news to my picked men that they were expected to lug sacks of corn instead of fight and when i did they kicked at once one of the irishmen said he would be teetotally damned if he enlisted to carry corn for mules and he would lay in the guardhouse till the war was over before he would lift a sack there was a strike on my hands to start on i was sorry that i had permitted myself to be promoted to corporal trouble from the outset one of the yankees suggested that we hold an indignation meeting so we rode up in front of a cotton warehouse and dismounted the scotchman was appointed chairman and for half an hour the ten picked men discussed the indignity that was attempted to be heaped upon them by compelling them to do the work of niggers they argued that a cavalry soldier's duty was exclusively to ride on horseback and that there was no power on earth to compel them to carry sacks of corn one of the dutchmen said he could never look a soldier in the face again after doing such menial duty and he would not submit to it the scotch chairman said if he had read the articles of war right there was no clause that said that the cavalry man should leave his horse and carry corn i was called upon for my opinion and said that i was a little green as to the duties of a soldier but supposed we had to do anything we were ordered to do but it seemed a little tough i told them i didn't want any mutiny and it would be a plain case of mutiny if they refused to work one of the irishmen asked if i would help carry sacks of corn and i told him that as commander of the expedition it would be plainly improper for me to descend to a common day laborer i held it to be the duty of a corporal to stand around and see the men work they all said that was too thin and i would have to peel off my coat and work if they did i told them i couldn't lift a sack of corn to save me but they said if that was the case i ought not to have come the quartermaster was looking around for the detail that was to unload the boat and he asked me if i had charge of the men detailed to unload i told him that i did have charge of them when we left camp but that they had charge of me now and said they wouldn't lift a pound he thought a minute and said i don't like to see you boys carrying corn sacks and rolling pork barrels why don't you chip in and hire some niggers the idea seemed inspired there were plenty of niggers around that would work for a little money one of the irishmen moved that the corporal hire ten niggers to unload the quartermaster's stores and the motion was carried unanimously i would have voted against it but the scotchman who was chairman ruled that i had no right to vote so i went and found ten niggers that agreed to work for fifty cents each and they were set to work the quartermaster promising not to tell in camp about my hiring the work done one of my dutchmen moved that 
inasmuch as we had nothing to do all day that we'd take in the town and play billiards and whoop it up until the boat was unloaded that seemed a reasonable proposition and the motion carried after an amendment had been added to the effect that the corporal stay on the boat and watch the niggers and see that they didn't shirk so my first command my ten picked men rode off up town and i sat on a wagon and watched my hired men it was four o'clock in the afternoon before the stuff was all loaded and after paying the niggers five dollars out of my own pocket some of my bounty money i went up to town to round up my picked men to take them to camp i found the scotchman pretty full of scotch whiskey he had found a countryman who kept a tailor shop who had a bagpipe and they were having a high old time playing on the instrument and singing scotch songs i got him on his horse and we looked for the rest the two germans were in a saloon playing pinochle and singing german songs and their skins were pretty full of beer and cheese they were got into the ranks and we found the irishmen playing forty-five in a saloon kept by a countryman of theirs and they had evidently had a shindig as one of them had a black eye and a scratch on his nose and they were full of fighting whiskey the yankees had swelled up on some kind of benzine and had hired a hack and taken two women out riding and when we rounded them up each one had his feet out of the window of the hack and they were enjoying themselves immensely the welshman was the only one that was sober but the boys said there was not enough liquor in the south to get him drunk when i got them all mounted they looked as though they had been to a banquet we started for camp but i did not want to take them in until after dark so we rode around the suburbs of the town until night drew her sable mantle over the scene they insisted on singing until within half a mile of the camp and it would no doubt have been good music only the scotchman insisted on singing the march of the cameron men while the irishmen sung lots of fun at finnegan's wake and the germans sung facht am rhein the yankees sung the star-spangled banner and the welshmen sung something in the welsh language which was worse than all all the songs being sung together of course i couldn't enjoy either of them as well as a corporal ought to enjoy the music of his command arriving near camp the music was hushed and we rode in and up to the captain's tent where i reported that the corn was unloaded all right he said that was all right everything would have passed off splendidly only one of the irishmen proposed three cheers for the dandy corporal of the regiment and those inebriated picked men gave three cheers that raised the roof of the colonel's tent near by because i had hired niggers to do the work and let the men have a holiday i dismissed them as quick as i could but the colonel sent for me and i had to tell him the whole story he said i would demoralize the whole regiment in a week more and i had better let up or he would have to discipline me i offered to resign my commission as corporal but he said i better hold on till we could have a fight and maybe i would get killed end of chapter 9 recording by arnold banner thurmond north carolina